Hello, I am Fernando Luzio and this is Novos Interpretes. To celebrate the first birthday of our program, we are now in New York, especially to interview Dr. Hapail, CEO, the founder and chairman of Archetab Discoveries Worldwide. We have had the opportunity to work with Dr. Hapail for two years, breaking strategic codes for companies in the United States and Brazil. Dr. Clotaire Hapail is an internationally known expert in cultural archetypes, creativity and innovation, who founded the Archetype Discoveries Worldwide in 1976. Based in Tuxedo, New York City, Archetype has associated offices in Belgium, China, Turkey, England, Paris, Mexico, Italy, India, South Korea, Southeast Asia, Russia and Brazil. Dr. Hapail introduced a breakthrough concept to the corporate world, the culture code, which has proven to be a powerful methodology for more than half of the Fortune 500 companies, such as Boeing, L'Oreal, General Motors, AT&T, Citibank, Chrysler, Fox Television, among others. His unique approach to marketing and strategy combines deep psychoanalysis with a businessman's attention to practical concerns. He has written more than 14 books. His last book, The Culture Code, ranked ninth in the bestseller list of Business Week and has been translated into 12 languages. In Korea alone, The Culture Code has sold more than 250,000 copies. He's a very much sought after lecturer on creativity, communication and cultural literacy. His world travels and extensive marketing research on products, services and brand archetypes for corporations and governments have given him a fresh perspective on American and global businesses and the interaction among the Americas, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. For the past 30 years, Dr. Hapayo has accumulated data and developed a powerful process to understand the golden question why people do what they do. Dr. Hapail, thank you very much for this unique interview. My pleasure. This unique opportunity, we are very honored to make this interview here in your home. And we would like to start off this interview by asking you to tell us briefly the story of your, inter your interesting life. Well, uh, I think I started being very interested in uh, the way children learn a language. That was one of my first uh, uh, interest was uh, working with autistic children. Some of them have a difficult time to learn any kind of language. And I was trying to understand what is the process, the mental process to learn a word, whatever the word is. And then I was working in, in Switzerland at the time uh, with children trying to learn uh, uh, French, German, Italian, the three major languages in Switzerland. There is a fourth one, Romance, but I, I didn't have any children trying to learn Romance. And I made at the time a series of little discoveries of the way uh, the brain function. Um, and my discovery was that there is an imprint. There is a moment where you imprint for the first time uh, what is coffee, uh, uh, what is love, what is work, what is uh, anything that, you know, each time you have a word, there is a moment where you have to imprint, create the mental system, the reference system there that you're going to keep using for the rest of your life. And working with these children, uh, I realized that when they were uh, from French, uh, Swiss uh, origin or Italian or German, they were using different languages, of course, but at the same time, the whole experience was different. And so suddenly they, they, were, they were discovering a world through the word that was different. And I can give you an example here is the, the, uh, the difference between the German and the French about uh, the sun and the moon. Right? Very, very important element because when you learn uh, what is the sun uh, in French, say it's masculine, le soleil. 
And Le Soleil is the Sun King, is with the 14, is you know, brilliant and powerful. And so in the French culture, men are supposed to be like this. They're supposed to be you know, brilliant and uh, uh, dominant and, you know, okay. And then the moon is a female, la lune. And so then in the, in the French mind, uh, women are very powerful, but at night, they have hidden power. Uh, they up and down, they into So all, all, all these mental categories, without being aware of it, when you are a little child, you learn about the sun, you learn about the moon, but you learn more than just the word sun and moon. You learn all the whole system about gender differences with men and women. Now, when you are German, wow, is a big issue here because this is the opposite. Mm -hmm. For the German, the sun is a female, the sun. And, and the German will say, of course, what do you ask? I mean, it's obvious. Women are the one that shine, women are the one that radiate, women are the one that are warm, they make children grow. I mean, the sun is a female. And the moon is a man, they are moon. And, and, you know, men, German men are always into dark things at night, philosophy, um, deep things, you know. Uh, uh, and so they, th this is a completely different situation here. This is, so my discovery at the time was that, oh, oh we have to be very careful because you, you, the, the translation of the word doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, if you translate the, 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 the sun from French to German, you lose you know, uh, you know, lost in translation, you lose all the deep meaning that is so powerful. And uh, as a simple consequence, I can give that to you. If you uh, want to sell shampoo uh, in, in Germany and France, <laughs> and you use the sun as a ref reference, you trigger a completely different response in one culture to another, and without being aware, you know. So th that's what, what is very key here. So that was my first, uh, uh, my first experience with uh, uh, autistic children. And, uh, and I made, uh, I gave a conference uh, at the University in Geneva, uh, uh, and uh, one of my students uh, asked his father to come to uh, my lecture, and, uh, and, uh, and he was working for Nestle, and he said, you know, uh, what you discover here, the, the deep meaning, the first imprint about the word, uh, might be very useful for us because we want to sell uh, instant coffee in Japan, and we're not very successful in trying to get them to switch from you know, tea to coffee, which is well, obviously not the right strategy at the time. Mm -hmm. And so they made me an offer that I could not refuse at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I went to Japan, and, and I discovered the code for coffee in Japan, and then, you know, L'Oreal uh, association with Nestle, and then, then, and then, then they started expanding uh, around the world. I was in, asked to teach in different business schools around the world, and and uh, and so published several books, and this is that's great how it, it went. Yeah. Okay. Could you explain to our listeners what the culture code is? Well. Um, in, in, in every culture, uh, the culture pre-organize the way you deal with something in the culture. Mm -hmm. My definition of a culture, it's a, a survival kit uh, inherited at birth in order to survive. So in, at a certain time, in a certain environment, a geography and so on, you need to know that in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And so then it's transmitted from one generation to another to another. After a while, we don't even question that anymore. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the first time you learn about coffee, for example, in Italy, is very different from the first time you learn about coffee in America. And this is why in America we drink uh, uh, liters of coffee every day and survive. But if this was Italian coffee, I would be dead at the end of the day. <laughs> so there is a very strong difference between you know, what, what means coffee in Italy. And, and there is a first imprint. And so this first imprint is pre-organized by the culture. When we just did the work on coffee uh, in, in America, we discovered that the first imprint is not the taste. The first imprint is the aroma. And this is unique for the American culture. It's very strong. The smell of coffee is so... Uh, and so when we work for Folger, we discover that and we say, well, this is the American culture code for coffee. Uh, uh, not working in Italy, I don't know about Germany, I didn't study it, but we have to be, but in the US, this is it. It's, you know, first imprint is when you are two. And when you are two year old, 
the whole cultural imprint is mother is preparing breakfast, she is in the kitchen, um, she's, I'm going to be fed, she loves me, I'm home, I'm safe. Boom. All these words are very powerful and very positive. And so, uh, as a strategy, we decided that Folger should own the aroma, forget about the taste. Let the competitor deal with the taste, because the culture code for coffee in America is aroma. And so then everything should be on code, which means that the packaging should be designed that when you, you know, you know, we injected aroma on top of it, so when you open it, psh, you get the aroma in your face. Uh, all the commercial, I, I told them I never want to see the brand Folger associated with somebody drinking coffee. No, it's a no, no. It's a no, no way. Huh? So, that, I mean, that kind of a surprise. Hey, we're selling coffee. Say, no, you're not selling coffee. You're selling the aroma. <laughs> Let the other sell the taste. You know, so, so that's the definition of the, 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 the culture code. Uh, it, it's a reference system, like mother, breakfast, you know, home, safe, and so on, imprinted at a very early age uh, uh, through the energy, the emotion that is associated with this reference system. And, uh, and, and the, the, the code is what activates this reference system. So the code for coffee is aroma, aroma activates all the reference system. Okay. And could, could you explain a, an overview, could you provide us an overview about the Archetype discovery process itself and how it differs from a traditional marketing right. research? Yes, you know, it, it, it's quite interesting because um, it's sometimes difficult to explain to people that this is not marketing research. This is not traditional kind of research, study, discover. I mean, this is a different thing. Um, what we do is, uh, uh, we call that a discovery. It's a discovery. We discover something that is there, but we were not uh, familiar with. Uh, the big, we, we could not see it. It was there, but we could not see it, right? And how do we do that? Uh, we follow the three brains principle, the fact that we have three brains. One is the cortex. Uh, the second one is a limbic and the third one is a reptilian. And my theory is that the reptilian always win. Doesn't matter what you do, if you get the reptilian, boom. Uh, so that the old brain, the very old part of the brain. So the process is we take groups of people and we want to guide them, to take them back to the very first time in their life that they imprinted through emotion what we want to discover. And in order to do that, First, we have to go through eliminating the cortex. So we have a three-hour session. In the first hour, uh, they speak. Uh, we don't care because we don't believe what people say. Mm -hmm. So they speak. But, but it's like a purge, like a washout session. And so when they finish with that, they're happy. They think they you know, gave a great contribution. But uh, we, we don't learn anything new here. You see, there, there is nothing serious here. The second hour is more emotional with the lambic. And so already they are into a world where there are contradiction, there are tension, they want and they don't want. The best way for me to explain this world of tension is uh, I've done work around the world uh, about mothers and how they uh, relate to their children, feed their children and so on. And around the world, in China, in India, in Italy, uh, in France, in Germany, in Brazil, mother will tell me, oh, I want my children to grow. And I don't want them to grow. I want, them to, I want them to be independent, and I don't want them to be independent. Yeah. You say, oh, they're so cute when they're little. Okay, I want them to grow up, of course, but they're so you know, so, so there is a tension, you see, and, and every mother can feel that. Mm -hmm. You see, so, so y y you want your children to grow, this is a program, but at the same time, you don't want them to leave. So when my clients say, we want our uh, customer uh, to love our products, I say, why? So they look at me and say, what do you mean? Why do you ask why? Of course we want the... So no, no, do you want your customer to love your products and never buy them? Or do you want your customer to hate your products and always buy them? <laughs> you see, this, there is not, is not an immediate correlation. Mm -hmm. You see, so there are things that you... The, 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 the key element that we want to create through the code that we discover is an intense relationship. And love-hate sometimes is very powerful, you see, but create long relationship. Then the third brain, so they go into that for the second hour, and then they get confused. They don't know what they're doing anymore. This is good. And then the <laughs> third hour, when they come back, uh, they lie down on the floor. So we explain that we want to recreate 
the same mental uh, uh, activity that they have when they wake up in the morning. Why? Because when you wake up in the morning, usually for five, ten minutes, you can still remember your dreams. But if you don't write them down or record them right away, five, ten minutes later, they're gone. So it means that when you have this kind of mental activity, uh, when you wake up in the morning, uh, the cortex usually uh, arrives late at work in the morning, as I used to say. So, so the cortex is not there, there is no control. So you're still into the connection between the reptilian and the limbic. And this is the kind of brain activity we want to recreate, which is very unique. Um, because when people are there at that moment after relaxation, uh, lie down on the floor, things come back to their mind. And people will tell me, oh, it's amazing, something came back that I forgot for 30 or 40 years, you know. And so there is a truth, it's a real thing, you know. And, and so, and then very important part of this methodology is that it's anonymous. They don't have to speak up. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've done a lot of work on, on subjects that are very taboo, huh? mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my first work with PNG was on charming toilet paper. Imagine that you are invited to a focus group session with uh, 20 strangers and for two hours you're going to have to explain how you use toilet paper. I mean, eh, you don't get much out of that, you see. People will say, oh, I want it soft on sales. Thank you. Can I go now? <laughs> That's it, you know. Yeah. But when we did this work, because of the old process, what we discovered were absolutely amazing, very powerful, very emotional. Um, and, and, and PNG was amazed that we never found anything like that. So after that, I've done more than 30 codes for PNG, of course, because they've found the very... So um, this is anonymous. And then the, the document that we get, because this is handwritten, they write down their first stories. Uh, we study at the structure, the pattern that is in all these stories that um, uh, we, we look at the space in between, if you want. This is very interesting, the notion of structure. Um, music is not made of note. Music is a space between the notes. So a melody, you can play with a different notes on the piano, left hand, right hand, different instrument. Uh, the only thing that you have to respect is a space in between. And that's what we discover. What is a space in between the different elements? Uh, Levi-Strauss, my, my professor, used to say that a mother is not a woman. A mother is a space between a woman and a child. The space in between. Wow. So if no children, no mother. No mother, no children. I mean, you need, you know, this is the space in between that you have to understand. So this is what we're trying to discover. What is the space in between that create the unconscious reference system, the unconscious melody that people use, activate when they think about a brand, a product, a category, a country, you know, that, that's what we're trying to discover. And this is unconscious, so you have to find a, a process to reveal it. Is You cannot see it right away, you know, you have to... Okay, great. We are fascinated with all the codes you have already broken. However, two of them we think are very provocative and insightful, both for individuals and companies. Can you share some of your findings on the codes of beauty and luxury? I'm going to tell you a little bit more than what you can find in my books, because I've been okay. done more work on, on, on that subject. Yeah. Uh, beauty is a very reptilian thing. Uh, uh, we program to find beautiful what is uh, uh, useful for our reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. All right? So even if we go into music and, and uh, uh, you know, art and opera and painting and sculpture, and that, there is always something there that is very reptilian, if you want. And, um, and I want to give you an example that uh, the, the woman's beauty, you know, woman's beauty. Uh, research has been done on the what is the most beautiful shape of a woman's body. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting, you know, because every, every culture is uh, interested in that. And so that was done by a, 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 a man and a woman, a couple from India. And they studied a woman's body in different cultures and in different centuries through sculptures and painting, because you can go back to the Egyptian, the Greek, the Roman, so on. Huh? So what is the best? Thing? And the way they did that is to put electrodes in every part of you know, the body of a group of men. Uh, and, and, uh, and so they did show some pictures of women and find out which get them excited. What do they like? They don't have to speak, you know, they just... And so the, the, the system was, ee, they're excited, oh, they're not excited. So, so you show them body, body, body. Right? And what they found, which is 
kind of an unconscious uh, uh, structure, code for beauty. Uh, this is global. Right? That the, when the body of the woman is like straight, like, like this, like just like, you know, oh, nobody's excited. So as, as a trigger, as a message for my reptilian brain, that doesn't tell me anything. But if the body of the woman is like an hourglass, like this, you know, uh, dee, all the men get excited. Ooh. So why is that? You know, I always want to understand why, right? Uh, uh, first of all, they did some statistic research. And uh, men, we are programmed, we're not so dumb after all, because we're programmed to find uh, the women that give us more chance for our genes to be reproduced. Now, when a woman has a body like that, we're not even sure it's a woman, so maybe we're wasting our time. <laughs> but when a woman is like this, the message is like, wow, she, you know, she is a woman, right? And what they found that was very interesting is that the, the key trigger is the relationship between the waist huh, and the hips. The waist and the hip. And that has to be 0 0.7. If the, the ratio is 0 0.7, ee, around the world. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So, and now then what they discover is that women that have 0 0.7 mm -hmm. have more children, live longer, and have less cancer. I mean, so we're not so dumb after all. <laughs> we're choosing the woman that has... The, now, then what they discover, which is very interesting, is that uh, it's not a question of how fat you are. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can be very fat, but still 0 0.7, ee, is not fat, is fat distribution. <laughs> Where do you put your fat, you see? But then, now we understand fashion. You know, why the Egyptians 5,000 years ago invented the corset? The corset was to press, you know, to make the, the waist smaller, to, to get to 0 0.7. Why the French invented these dresses with big, you know, again, to create the old dimension there, you see? So, again, suddenly start making sense, you know, it's not just by, chance random or accident that thing like that happen. They happen because unconsciously we have a perception uh, 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 of beauty that is uh, very key here. So, the, the, so some element about the code for beauty. There is a lot more I can tell you more. Luxury varies from one culture to another again. It's very, very, you know, uh, um, for example, in, 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 in the French culture, uh, luxury should be useless. Uh, in the American culture, nothing should be useless. Everything should have a, you know. Mm -hmm. So in the French culture, uh, if you have a scarf around your neck, it's because you're afraid to catch a cold. So this is not luxury. But if you put a scarf on your shoulder, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, you, don't you don't need it because your shoulder is not going to catch a cold, because it's useless. You see, so the beauty of elegance is, you know, the, if it has, if you need it for some reason, then it's not, you know. Uh, the, 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 the same with food. Luxury in food in France is, uh, uh, you should not eat because you, you need food. Mm -hmm. You eat for pleasure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you should not drink wine because you're thirsty. You know, if you go to test wine, they give you water first, and so, because if you're thirsty, you drink water. Yeah, but the wine is for the pleasure. So this notion of, you know, American culture is very opposite. Mm -hmm. It has, no, it has to have a purpose. I want, I need something that, that does something, you know. So, mm -hmm. so the, the, the notion here are very, very different. By the way, there is a lot of similarity between the notion of luxury uh, in, in France and in China. Very interesting. The, the Chinese uh, uh, you know, aristocracy, the Chinese uh, emperor, they, all, they had a, a sense of beauty and things that were very pure and uh, n n not mundane purpose, if you want. That was very, very, very key. That. But one of the things that we discovered recently uh, for several clients about luxury is that there is a global code for luxury, which is very, very interesting. And, and, uh, and this code that we discover in very one simple word, very one word to understand luxury worldwide. You see, this is uh, the beauty of what we do here. And what is this word? Hand. 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 The future of luxury is going to be hand. Which is, is not made in France, made in China, no, it's made by hand. 
made by hand, bespoke, and is not even luxury anymore. It is the, the passion of an artist, an artisan, that is going to do something by hand, very careful. And so Hermès is a very good example of a company that is very successful worldwide. Uh, but they even don't want to use the word luxury. I spoke with them recently in Paris. Uh, they, they, they don't, you know, they say we're not really in luxury. We are into craftsmanship, artisan, le, le, love, le travail. It is going back to almost medieval time where you have the compagnon uh, and, and you have to work very hard before you become a maître, a master in, 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 in your art and your craftsmanship, you see. So things done by hand is amazing, amazing. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the new Rolls Royce, for example, all the leather inside is done by hand and carefully and the wood and, and, and then bespoke, bespoke which uh, 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 sur mesure, tailored, tailored made, you know. So uh, very, very big, very big issue. I mean, uh, s some brands cannot do it completely, but they can offer an element of that. The Mini Cooper, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you can choose, you can pick and choose something special just for you. The, you know, can put a, a British flag on the roof if you want and you can put a, I mean, Again, this is a direction of, of, of luxury. Mass production is not going to be luxury. No way. No way. By hand, unique. And, and so, for example, the, uh, I, I, I just bought a, a, a sofa uh, Hermes in France, you know, and, and uh, they told me, okay, you have to pay upfront and there is six months delay. You have to wait for six months. Nice. All right. I know the French invented slow food. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, the notion of time, it takes time to create luxury, you know, and then you, and, and you can, so once in a while I can go and see the progress of my sofa, because these people are working hard, there is like three people doing it, and you know, and, just, uh, and they're doing by hand, and, the, and they, they, they test the leather, and they try the leather, and you know, it's just, it's an art, they are artists. You know, and in French, artisan and artiste is almost the same word, you see. So, so it, it's, it's, uh, I like it very much because it, it gives a lot of value to uh, the talent of, of some people and the, the passion and, and the dedication and the commitment they have to do a good job. You see, and so I think that production, the mass production um, is, you know, it's not so uh, interesting anymore because, you, you know, everything. But on, on the other hand, uh, uh, the mass production, the price is going down all the time. Huh? When luxury, I can tell you the price is going to go up and up, no limits. <laughs> no limits you know yeah yeah you, you, you know uh, you you have a, a, a bugatti car now that is what 2.5 million you see oh, where is the limit why not 10 million you know so, so but, but but this is very special very unique very you know the quality there is uh, amazing and uh, concerning individuals can we be uncovered would I have a personal code? Yes. Do you know your personal code for example? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, great. Oh, yes, of course, of course. This is fascinating, you know, because uh, uh, when I work with children, you know, there is, there is a very, very key element in, in the evolution of children, as I'm sure you know. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, when, when babies are together, so one baby cries, all the baby cries because they don't know that, they think they are crying too, so, so they, they don't see the difference between one baby and the other, right? Um, then after a certain time, there is a moment where the child's evolution, the first time uh, you say no, and then the first time you say I. And so when you say I, there is, wow, this is, you know, I want that. I don't want that. I you know, say. And so this first discovery of your identity you know, is quite amazing. So if you have different brothers or sisters, or if you're alone, if you're, you know, all that system at a certain time creates your identity. And, and at that moment, uh, you, you start having the first imprint of your code. But then after that, there is repetition, of course, and there is reinforcement. You know, and then, of course, your environment, your parents, all that, they, they reinforce your idea, which could be negative, of course, because in, in, in case of neurotic people, hey, you're never going to be able to do anything, you are a bad boy, whatever. Okay, so then, but if you get a reinforcement in another direction, very interesting. So then you start, ah, being confirmed about, you know, this dimension there. So, yes, we, we you know, it, it takes time to discover your personal code, of course, um, but it's, it's very important to understand it. 
in terms of, you know, if you know your code, uh, well, you know, you, you might not make a mistake in choosing your job, for example. You want to find a job that is on code with you. Uh, maybe the place where you live in the world, all that is very important because all that should help to reinforce your code and help. The, 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 the big problem in, uh, in, then for many individuals is that they confuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, they want to do that, but they want to do that also, but they say, oh, maybe I should be there. And then in this confusion, the result is procrastination. They don't do anything. Yeah. They don't succeed, you see. Uh, Napoleon, he knew exactly what he wanted. <laughs> of course, it could, that could be dangerous <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, the brrr, it has one idea in mind and just, and, and he knew his code and, and everybody was saying, hey, you crazy? I mean, what do you think you are? Well, I'm the emperor. The emperor? What is that? I mean, it's just, you know, so, you know, I mean, and, and so that, that was very interesting because when, when he was a, a, a prisoner in, in his island, you know, in the, the, by the British, uh, one of the big, big uh, um, suffering that he had at the time that the British refused to call him the emperor. Wow. So, yes, it's very important to, to uh, know your code and to discover your code and then to, to start managing your life in some ways uh, to be on code with that. And, uh, and your question is, do I know my code? So, of course, I know my code very, very much. And, you know, I, I have... A, a, several models in my life, you know, and, and uh, one of the number one uh, uh, model is, uh, 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 you know, the Champollion, which is, uh, in Champollion was a young guy that went with uh, Napoleon in Egypt. Yeah? And, and Champollion did something that I think is what I do every day. Uh, Champollion looked at the hieroglyphic they had been there for like 400, 500 years, I don't remember exactly, and nobody was able to understand what was there, you see. And so you look at that and they had no idea what it is. And he was the first one to be able to decode, to find the code, and then to start reading things that were there, but nobody could see it. You see, and, 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 and that my life, my life is to look at things that nobody can understand and decode and suddenly, whoa, suddenly everything makes sense. But this is not my code. I, I, I think, you know, my name is Clotaire and, and it's very close to Voltaire. And Voltaire for me is a model. I mean, the book I'm reading right now is another book about Voltaire. Uh, I, I think he, he, my code uh, is more, is Voltaire with a little bit of Champollion and a little bit of Alexis de Tocqueville and so on. But it's more Voltaire and, and, and I like, what I like about Voltaire is uh, his uh, um, ability to be a, a, a philosopher, an artist, a poet, a scientist, and a philosopher, and at the same time a good businessman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very good businessman, you see. So, so this combination, uh, but in the final world, because I don't want to spend too much time on that, uh, my code is 18. 18. 18 means 18th century. French 18th century. Great. That's my code. You know, I, I, I love everything about the 18th century, uh, the philosophers. I don't like the way it ended, because the French Revolution was a disaster and, and mm -hmm. killing people for no reason and so on. But the, the, the 18th century, the, uh, from 1715, uh, at the death of Louis XIV to uh, 1789, uh, that's where you have the most fant I mean, you have Montesquieu, you have uh, Voltaire, you have Mozart, you have, you know, the, for me the best music is, I love Mozart music. I mean, the 18th century was l'art de vivre, elegance, style, beauty, a pleasure of life. I mean, the main purpose, I know it's kind of superficial in some way, but the main purpose of the French culture at the time was uh, um, elegance in pleasure, you see. Uh, uh, that, that was fantastic. So uh, that's my century. I'm sure I, 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 my, in a former life, uh, <laughs> I was a philosopher <laughs> over there. Yes, uh, oh, very interesting. Well, I have always seen a strong connection between strategy and the culture code. We define strategy as the set of choices and trade-offs that a company does in order to achieve yeah. a perception of singularity in the customer's mind yeah. 
and then raise its willingness to pay, which drives value creation. Today, in the business environment, in any place in the world, it's not a battle of products anymore. Instead, it's a fierce competition of business models. And that's why companies have been developing capabilities in challenging their strategy, that what we, that's what we call the business model innovation. Right. It starts with a deep understanding uh, of the customer's concerns, aspirations and behavior. And by doing so, we can challenge the way the company customer values pro value proposition, right. also design more convenient ways to uh, reach the customers through alternative channel formats, and also developing a, a more appropriate customer relationship, some of the building blocks of the strategy. How can we use the archetype discovery in order to review a better picture of the customer needs and therefore produce powerful insights and bring competitive advantage to the, to the company? You see, uh, it, it, it's, it's crucial to understand what people really want. Uh, but in the same time, we can't believe what they say. So obviously we cannot just ask them what you're not aware of, tell me what you're not aware of. Right? So any corporation today has to understand the unspoken, uh, unconscious and unaddressed need of the customer. You know, what do they want that they're not even aware of? And if you want to be ahead of a competition, you have to be the first one to discover what they really want. Right? And this is what we do. And so let me give you an example. Um, as you know, because you uh, work with me with Boeing, uh, Boeing is one of my clients. And one day they asked me, uh, what do people really want in an airplane? You know, we would design an airplane, we want to know what they, what they really want. Okay. Um, because we have to compete against Airbus, the European, and we want to be ahead in terms of understanding what people really want. And so during this, the archetype discovery process, you know, uh, we discover that they had no idea what they want because they, they, they listen to people. So when you ask people, what do you want in an airplane? They say, oh, I want leg rooms. Mm -hmm. I want good food. I want good entertainment. I want good service. I want all the movies and everything. Okay, so that's what they say. So they say, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And the European believe them, believe the customer. And so they build a big, you know, uh, Airbus where you're going to die with 800 people, as I say. <laughs> Huge, <laughs> humongous, uh, airplane. Mm -hmm. um, but what we discover is that this is not what they want. When people that travel all the time as money, mm -hmm. they take a private jet yes. where they have no legroom, no food, okay. no entertainment and no service, yeah. and they pay 10 times more yeah. for the private jet. Why? Because when you use a private jet, what you get is no airport. What really people want is no airport. Now, think about the, f the, f the f beauty of this discovery, because everybody right now is building bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger airports. But I predict that what people want is no airport, no airport. So why? Because airports, as I usually say, has been designed by mentally retarded engineers. I mean, this is the worst place that you want to go through, you see. and so. The, the, the whole notion of being able to arrive with your car next to the private jet and one step, you know, you go from one step, you go from the plane, from the car to the plane, that's it, one step. One step is the ideal situation. Look at the, the absurdity of this corporation and airports where they keep adding a step, another step, and another step. So you have to take your luggage over there, then you have to go there, then you have to go to security, then you have to take off your shoes, then you have to go. I mean, one more, each time there is one more step, I mean, say, uh, yeah. So this is very interesting because that's why we designed the 787. The Dreamliner, uh, which is a big success for Boeing, is an airplane that competes with a big Airbus because this, the big Airbus, if you want to go from Paris to Detroit, you have to go to a hub. You have to go to Chicago, change plane, they lose your luggage, the plane is delayed, and all the thing. Yeah? So the, the Dreamliner is the opposite. We, we didn't suppress completely airports, but less airports, which is the right direction. Right? So the Airbus can only go through hubs. 
You need a lot of space. The Dreamliner can go from anywhere to anywhere non-stop. So when, when I have to fly commercial, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I say, hey, I want to non-stop. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they try to cheat me and say, oh, it's direct. No, no, I don't want direct, I want non-stop. Because <laughs> they say it's direct, but you have to change plane in yes. Sao Paulo. I say, no, no, no. <laughs> so th- that's in the, right, in the right direction. But now, let me tell you what is going to happen. And uh, uh, I know it might be like a shock for some people, but um, you know, I, I travel all the time. I'm in China, I'm in India. India is very backward in terms of uh, infrastructure. So they start investing a lot of money, building big airports. You know, they, and so the whole idea about the airport is so big now that they have to be away from the city. You know, uh, 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 Denver International Airport, I call him dumbest international airport in the world. I mean, the, the, it's so far away from Denver that you have to take a car and to drive for an hour almost. To go. So when we know that what people want is no airport. So what is the technology going to have to do? We already have technology for airplanes to take off without airports. All right, so we, we don't need an airport. We, uh, the technology is now used in military purposes, mm-hmm. huh? but you can take off like this, yeah. right? So you can take off from the roof of the, any building. Yeah. Second, we have the technology to make all the airplanes silent. Wow. No noise. Right. Of course, to, today it costs too much money, we're not there yet, right? But remember at the very beginning of a car in England, Huh? Mm-hmm. You needed to have a guy with a flag and a trumpet in front of the car to go through a village. Yeah. And at the time that was the first car, they said, oh, this is never going to be generalized. Nobody is going to, we're not going to have cars everywhere because you know, if you need a trumpet and a, and a flag before in front of so. so the same today, we have the same reaction. Oh, we're not going to have airplanes, it's too much, too cost man, much money to develop. And, you know. I predict that in the future, all these crazy airports that they're building in India and in China are going to be, you know, like like museum yeah. of the past because nobody is going to go there. We don't need them. You see. So, what happened to the horses and carriage <laughs> is going to happen to the airport because we discovered that what people want is no airport, no airport. This is it. You know, and so bigger airport with more traffic jam is never is not the purpose. Third, we now developing private jet for 1.5 million. So it's cheaper than a Bugatti. <laughs> so private jet are going to be so cheap that they're going to become the taxi. Taxis, you know. So I mean, you, you want to go from if I want to go from here to to uh, to Detroit, right? Uh, I, uh, it's not too far, right? So I have to take one hour to go from here to the, to the airport. Then I have to arrive two hours before the, the flight. Yeah. Then usually an average of flight is half an hour late or 45 minutes. That's another hour. Then I have two hours flight. Yeah? Then when I arrive there, I have to wait for my luggage and then I need another hour. So that's already like nine hours. That's the time it takes to drive. Yes. When I used to work at GM, <laughs> uh, I was driving, you know, I mean, it would be better because like this, I can stop when I want, I can take all the luggage I want, I don't, I'm not insulted by uh, ex-cons trying to, uh, that we call security guys. I mean, you know, but in the future, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, will, I will have the car arriving in, 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 uh, in, in the park over here and I mean the, the plane arriving at there and taking me there and, and it will be a two hour flight will be a two hour flight. Yes. You see, so what customer want? They don't calculate the time the same way that airlines. Airlines say uh, we give you the time from the gate, departing gate to the arrival gate. That's yes. what we do. Right? We, uh, no, my time is from my home yes. to my meeting in Detroit. Detroit. That's the time. You see? And so what customers want, they want the time of the travel to be the real time. The, uh, the time you know, they don't want to lose all this time in, in, in between. And, and this is what is going to be successful in the future. I'm, you know, I, and we can already see that, for example, the, 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 the people that manufacture small jets, private jets, 
um, you know, I'm making a fortune. They're doing very well, very well. Now, now you're going to tell me this is only for a minority and a small group of people. Yeah, like cars, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, uh, 20th century, they were for just a minority. So, you know, so this is the evolution. But in order to forecast, to predict the future, that's what we have to understand. Many traditional business models, such as media publishing, automobile, energy industries, and others are being challenged and threatened by disrupting technologies and other social phenomena. In your opinion, for example, the physical book will disappear in the upcoming years, and how, in your opinion, can the archetype discovery process help these industries to redesign their business models and readapt? It's very interesting because I've been contacted by uh, Penguin mm -hmm. in London and I went to visit them and, and we were working together and they wanted to understand the code for books. Wow. You know, what is a book? Why do we need a book? Right. And, uh, you know, I, I usually say the reptilian always win. You know that, the reptilian always win. Um, a book is something that you can touch and feel and carry and you know is a weight, is is a sound when you go around, is there is a sensuous relationship with the book. Right? Uh, you don't have that with an iBook or you don't have that with an iPod. You don't have that with uh, okay. Um, so th th there is a dimension in the book that you don't have in the other document. Now beside that the technology is such that you know if if I look at a book Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, you know, I, I, I take a book and I go to the page uh, uh, 190 and if you have an iPod, I'm there before you. Yes. You see? So, a lot of work we have done on uh, internet and technology is that uh, you have to uh, lose time to save time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> ah, you, so, you lose so much time on these things, you know. I don't lose time when I want to go to my book, I have my, you know, so... so you know, and so then there is this notion of having all your books over there, you see. Uh, we have done a lot of work in creativity and, and our brain is very sensitive mm -hmm. to the environment, you know, to, to the things that are over there, but we don't pay attention unconsciously, but we are influenced by this environment, right? And so when I, when I am in my library and I have all my books over there, you know, I know where they are. I know exactly where they are. And, and I, I like to touch this one. I like to open this one. I go back to this one. I can, you know, so there, there is a stimulation of the mind, you know, w with a depth. The reality of the electronic world is that it's very superficial. It's quick and fast, but superficial. You never go in depth, yeah. right? Um, it's quite interesting to see that uh, Encyclopedia Britannica mm -hmm. is now on the internet, yeah. right? But if I read recently, uh, some people have, the, have the, the Encyclopedia on the internet, but they still want to have the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see, so you, the, the brick and mortar thing, yeah. you see, is, is one doesn't replace the other. It, it's a big mistake to think that uh, electronic is going to replace, you know. Uh, in, in terms of reptilian brain, uh, you, you, you might want to be able to, to see your children on, on, on Skype, for example, you know, and can speak with your way, you speak with. Is it going to replace hugging them, kissing them, touching them, eating with them, you see? So it's never going to replace that. This is it, it's very simple, right? It's quite amazing to see lux the evolution of luxury. Uh, right now, in, in different places, in California, in Europe, in, uh, uh, you have hotels mm -hmm. where there is no electricity at all. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to have your cell phone. You're not allowed to have any computer. Uh, there is no electricity. There is candles, fire in, in, in a fireplace, uh, and books. Mm. And you pay $1,000 a night <laughs> to have the privilege are not being disturbed by ping, long, ding, I know. <laughs> so suddenly you see the, 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 the need for the real thing, you know, instead of always being, you know. So after a while you need meditation, you need to think, you need to have time to be with your children, you need to do simple things, you need to touch people, you know. And so that's why the book uh, is, is going to be a, a, a handmade, you know, and, and, uh, and by the way, just to give you an example, uh, I published a, a special edition 
uh, anniversary for my culture code book and I will give you one uh, special one and this is this is a, a, a book that is I sign is numbers each book has a number and uh, at the end there is an imprint of my hand <laughs> You see, as a symbol of luxury and handmade book, well, you know, so, so it's a, like special edition with numbers and, and so again, th that, that is the evolution, you know. Uh, um, books, uh, we, we, we try to create uh, pocket books that have no value, uh, but in the same time there is this leather bound book that are, you know, very beautiful and things and, and, and it's, it's, it's more than the content, you know, the, as I said, the structure is the message. When I like to touch a book, it's already a message for me, yeah. you see. I don't have this feeling with things on the... It's an iPad. No. Yeah. But when I want to do some research for writing my, my next book, it's good to have access to the internet, to have all the reference system that I want. It's good, of course, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't change the fact that, you know, I know where my books are and I... Mm -hmm. Is like friends in my life, you see. Um, there is a saying in, in, in the French culture, we say, and I think it works in English too, uh, uh, a house without books is that a man without a soul. Wow. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I don't think the electronic soul will replace it. <laughs> Amazing. Great. As you have already mentioned, sustainability is the new moral of contemporary companies. Yeah. And we are witnessing the challenges many companies face in order to educate and align their stakeholders with the desirable, desired sustainable mindset and attitudes. How can we imprint sustainability in the corporate culture of modern organization? Well, you see, the, the, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't like this word, sustainability. Let me tell you, I, I don't, because, you know, uh, uh, you don't want to sustain, you want to improve, you want to increase, you want to grow, you see. So sustain is like, okay, using the brake, you know, and, and stop. And I remember many years ago, it was a zero growth movement, you know, we should go into zero growth. Huh? Um, I, 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 this is not reptilian. This is not reptilian. So that's why sustainability uh, in terms of, of, of slogan, the philosophy, so on, had a hard time. Because he's not reptilian, he's almost giving up the reptilian, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, it, it's, it's ridiculous um, to kill your customer. Yeah. <laughs> if you kill your customer, then there is no customer anymore. You see, so, so you, you, you don't want to cheat your customer, you don't want to take advantage of them, you don't want to take advantage of the environment, you don't want to kill the environment. Why? Because then after that, what do you do? So the reptilian mind is that you should create a harmonious relationship of growth. Yeah. Not just sustain, but growth, changing. Uh, one thing that we know for sure, uh, uh, that change is not going to change. I mean, <laughs> the world is changing all the time. All the time, you see. So sustainability means for me um, that you're able to anticipate the changes and to be in harmony with the changes. I like better the word harmony than sustain, you know, sustain kind of a, 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 a repressing kind of a, you know. I, I like the movement, I like the growth, I like the innovation, I like the progress, I like the, you know. Uh, for me, uh, harmony in the long term, uh, reciprocal growth is what, what is interesting for me. You know, I, 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 it's clear and it's quite interesting to see that this is very Chinese. You know, Chinese, the, the notion of reciprocity is very Chinese. When it, we did the code for, the, for China, it's very interesting. Um, the, the Chinese don't like the American because the American, they just want to make a sale. They want to sell something and they... And, and Chinese know, I mean, and for, for the Chinese to respect you, you have to ask for reciprocity. Which means, and that's kind of a definition for me of sustainability long term, if you want, is that I take care of you, you take care of me. All right? So this is reciprocity. And this is very much part of Confucius and all approach is that, you know, we should take care of each other because it's, it's an interrelationship. We, we need each other, you see. So why do I want to win if you lose? I mean, this is, 
this is you know it's not just win-win it's more than win-win is is permanent growth you know we, we take care of each other and this should be the same with the environment should be the same with the planet should be the same you know and what is what is very important today uh, we call that anthropocene anthropocene for the first time uh, humans are changing the planet you know, we're changing the planet. We, we're not paying attention to the fact that we are really changing this planet, you know. So, uh, you know, Buck, Buckminster Fuller said, uh, uh, you know, uh, planet Earth is the only spaceship that have no pilot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think more than, than um, protecting the planet, I think we need a pilot. Uh, we need somebody that can say, this is the way we want this planet, where we want this planet to grow and how we're going to create, you know. And, it's not zero growth. Uh, I don't think this is this is the idea. Uh, you know, it's it's just like we need to have a long-term reciprocity, uh, mutual enhancing and mutual growth uh, in on, on on this planet. Great. Strategy is closely related to human behavior because in order to support the strategy execution, people must change the way they usually work. And at the, same, the, at the same time that people want change, they resist to change. Why? Do you believe that people can really change? And how the archetype discovery process could help companies uh, with the challenges of change management? Uh, this is a very fascinating subject. Um, my first reaction is, uh, yes, people can change, but it's very difficult. <laughs> It's sometimes a lot easier to change and get somebody else. <laughs> change people that change people. You see, uh, the, the joke is uh, don't change people, change people. Yeah? Which means take somebody else. It takes, it's a lot faster. Uh, but why is it so difficult to change? Uh, because usually we want people to change too late. It's too late when we arrive. You know, it's too late. I mean, is is and going back to my experience with learning uh, to speak and learning languages, um, you know, I, I I speak English with an accent because I learn English too late. <laughs> you know, if my son uh, Dorian uh, speak uh, uh, French, uh, English, and Spanish with no accent because he learned the three languages before five, before he was five. You see, so. When, when, when you learn something at a very early age, it's imprinted in your mind and it's very difficult to change. So, uh, uh, my uh, uh, taste for cheese is the French cheese. Mm -hmm. I tried American cheese, you know, am I going to change? I don't want to change. <laughs> I like the French cheese, you know, I don't want... So, th there are some elements that you feel comfortable. There is a, a zone in, in, in everybody's mind and everybody uh, um, uh, unconscious that you're comfortable with and you don't want to change, to change that. Um, now, f changing individuals. Yeah, it's possible, but it's very difficult. But what you can do is to find tensions in everybody. So, there is a tension. So, you know, you, 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 you love and hate, all right. So, but this tension exists, right? So there are things that you like and things that you don't like. But you can move on this axis. So you can be a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And you, so, so, for example, I believe that um, uh, I was born in France and, and I have many, many imprints uh, coming from the French culture. But uh, during the war, uh, my first imprint of American was this American tank and the German running away. And I immediately imprint that, oh, the American are the winner, they're strong guys, I want to be one of them. So then I went to see uh, you know, Gary Cooper, John Wayne, uh, Burt Lancaster, all the movies, and I identify. And so I have some imprints on both sides. Yes. Now, change. Do I want to change? Well, I know that if I want to change in a sense that uh, I want to work harder, I go to my American side, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if I want to enjoy more luxury and pleasure, I go to my friend side, you know. So I'm not even cha really changing, I'm moving into an axis that I have. And one way to make people change is to discover these axes that they have in their code and help them to move more than one way or the other, you know. So you don't change the axis, you don't imprint, it's too late. When you are 20, 30, 40, it's too late. But, but to discover this axis and suddenly discover that, oh, there are directions 
that you might want to. So if you discover one element that is already there and you make him conscious about it and you push in this direction, they say, oh, yeah, sure, of course I want to do it, you see. But if you try to impose something from outside that is completely, you know, okay. Uh, corporations, can they change? Yes, they can change, uh, faster than, than government, faster than politicians. Uh, why? Because there is a vote every day. You sell or you don't sell your products. You see, so, so then the way to change is what I call short feedback. To make people change in a corporation, they should know immediately the result of their action. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the, the problem that we have is when we delay the feedback, we delay the reward. Uh, try to train a horse by giving the horse a feedback once a year. I mean, you're never going to train the horse. You need to do it right away. So I remember uh, uh, MBNA, uh, the, the credit card, you know, I worked for them at the time. And I say, when people are trying to sell, you know, they should have a goal. You should have a goal there. We want to do, uh, I want to, uh, to have 200,000 200, new credit cards today, the old group, right? Mm -hmm. And so then there is the number on top. How many did we do today? So, you know, 200,000, we are 185,000, 190,000, 195,000. They see immediately, oh, they make a phone call, wrong the change. We're not going to change anything. And so then it's six o'clock and they say, oh, we, we need two missing. Push. You see, you don't get that kind of result uh, incentive when you give them a, a, a bonus at the end of the year. You know, they, they have no, no immediate in incentive. So I, I, I think that the, the, the uh, technology today uh, give us the possibility for people to really have a feedback and adjust their comportment, their behavior according to what they're doing right or wrong. They can see right, right, right away. And we don't use this technology, the, the, the bureaucracy delayed everything, everything. This is wrong. This is wrong. You see, for example, uh, we can change hospitals. Uh, 100,000 one, yes, 100,000 people die every year in America because of malpractice in a hospital. Mistake made in a hospital. 100,000, twice more than during the old Vietnam War, right? Every year, right? Now we work on that and how can we change that? Well, they don't see improvement. Mm -hmm. There is no sign that tell them this is we're doing, you know. For example, the, the, the way you dispose of all the waste, you know, okay. Uh, there is no measure, they don't have any feedback for that. The way that physicians go from one patient to another, they don't wash their hands, you see. So if you start putting sign, and each time a physician go wash his hand, and then clink, there is another number, clink, clink, you know. So how many washed their hands yesterday? Uh, uh, 125. Today, 145. Oh, we improve. And you have a visual curve. You know, how many people put the waste in the right box? You know, so visualize, put a curve, simple, you know, and people see that they, and they won't say, so when they see that, oh, we have to do better tomorrow. <laughs> you see, because they can see the result. And, and, and this visualization of the feedback, the, of the whole reward system, you know, people want to do good. And to show them that they're doing better than yesterday is a reward. But if you don't show them, they, they don't know. How can they change? Yeah. You have broken the code of many different cultures. What is your perception about the strengths and weaknesses of the Brazilian culture? And how do they affect the competitiveness in our way of doing business in a global scenario, in a global world? Um, you know, the, as you know, the cliche is uh, that Brazil is the, the, the country of the future. Yeah. And it has been the country of the future for what, 100 years? Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> the future is never arriving. Right? Yes, never arriving. <laughs> but I think this, the future is arriving. You see, I think this is, uh, you know, um, I, I, I went to uh, Brazil the first time in 1969. Mm -hmm. And I study uh, the Indians in, uh, in Xingu, mm -hmm. you know, I was part of the Museo do Indio uh, in, in, in Rio, and, and uh, I think it was in Rio, and, and I went to Xingu. And, but, you know, the, the, the perception I have since then, because I've been watching the evolution of Brazil since that moment, um, it, it, the, the, the potential is incredible. Absolutely, right. Mm -hmm. a, a culture is going to be successful in the future if they have a contribution to make to the planet. That's it, it's very simple. 
So what is your contribution? You know, the French culture, uh, they like it or they don't like it, but the only thing they can bring to the rest of the world is luxury. So with a socialist communist government, it's bad, it's difficult to accept. <laughs> but this is the only thing they can, they can do, you know, Cartier, Van Cleef, uh, Champagne, uh, you know, okay. All right, but there is a contribution there they can bring to, 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 to the world. Brazilian, what can they bring to the world? You see, this is what is interesting. And, and for me, uh, first of all, the Brazilian culture is almost the opposite of the Argentinian culture. You know, it's a feminine culture, it's a woman, woman's side. And this notion of uh, uh, mulher guerreira, uh, which means that I'm going to work hard every day to improve uh, the condition, the life of my family. You know, this notion of persistence and with a certain optimism, but a reality. I, I'm realistic and optimistic at the same time. Uh, the, the, the Brazilian uh, mulher guerreira, woman uh, uh, guerreira, she, she knows that life is difficult. She knows that she doesn't have all the money she needs. She knows that, but she doesn't give up. She works a little bit more every day, a little bit more. So this consistency in, in the hard work and needing of improvement is something that is very strong. But what the contribution is more the feminine side. Uh, I, I believe that um, global leaders in the future are going to be women. Wow. I, I, I'm completely convinced of that. Why? Because, you know, we're going to have to start thinking like women. <laughs> You know, in, in most of the business school, and I'm doing some work right now on higher education around the world, uh, there is no classes on how to think like a woman. All right? Big mistake. Yeah. Why? Because we only think like men, but we don't understand that women think differently. What is the big difference? As you know, biology, mm -hmm. that's the basic for, basis for reptilian dimension. Men are exclusive. How men make a definition? This is not it cut off, this is not it, cut off, this is not, they eliminate, 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 then what, that's it, now we have a definition, mm -hmm. right? And that is hard data, we have done work around the world for that. Women make definition by inclusions. This is it too, and then this is it too, and this is it too, and this is it too, and, and what is very, very uh, difficult to accept by men is that this is never finished. <laughs> it's never done. You can keep adding and adding. Yeah? And so I think the, the, the Brazilian culture for me is a very feminine culture. Uh, uh, we can learn about this inclusive dimension, inclusion. You know, I, I remember I had a feijoada with, with, with you one day, and one of the things we learned about feijoada is that you can always add some water if there is new people coming, and they're always welcome, and there's, it's not exclusive, you know, it's inclusive. The same with, with race, I mean, um, I, I had a, in, in the 70s, I, I had a, a friend in, in Rio, uh, and he was from, he was Japanese, for me he was completely Japanese. Huh? But, but when I say, but you say, hey, don't tell me I'm Japanese, I'm Brazilian. I was born in Brazil, my parents were born in Brazil, oh, you, mean I'm Jap well, you look Japanese, ah, so what's the point? <laughs> You know, and then I, I, I had, a, I, I remember this beautiful woman, but she was, a, you know, a part Japanese, part uh, African, part uh, uh, Swiss, part, I mean, she has all this mix. And wow, the result was fa fantastic, you see. So um, the, the, we, we need uh, that inclusiveness that the Brazilian culture can bring to, to the rest of the world. You see that right now in Europe, there is a big danger to see racism and fascism coming back. Very, very big, very big. Um, I don't think you, you know, this is not part of the Brazilian mindset, you see. It's more inclusive, it's more accepting the pleasure, it's more open. Um, and, and I think that the fact that you have a, a, a woman leader, um, and even Lula, I think, was more feminine than <laughs> and many feminine traits, many feminine, you know, he was good. Um, so th that is one of the things that I find very good in the, in, in, the, in the Brazilian culture and the contribution that Brazil can bring to the... Wow, interesting. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the, the, your uh, worry about the Europe and as an archetypologist, how can Americans and Europeans explore the power of their culture codes in order to overcome the crisis and turn around? You know, the, 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 the crisis that we have today, 
uh, is uh, uh, the dominance of the cortex. So the problem with the Americans were very, very good for many years, centuries, and because they were not two cortex. Mm -hmm. You see, the, 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 the cliche is American have a bias for action, uh, so let's do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, it, but let's do it. Yeah. Right. Uh, the European at the opposite, they want to think, they want to organize, they want, you know, so, so the, the, the result is more laws, regulation, slowing down the process, you see. So the, 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 the problem with the new administration, uh, in, uh, of the Obama administration in America, is that they, they, they're very much European in the way of thinking. So they create more laws, more regulation, they slow down the process, they want to create bigger government. You know, and they should look at France. 65% um, of, the, of the budget in France is the government. So, you know, and, and there's, everybody, everybody is leaving. Nobody is want to create more. I mean, uh, uh, France has a deficit of 100 billion a year, mm -hmm. when the Germans make 200 billion surplus. So what is the big difference between the two? Well, the French Jews don't want to work and they want the government to take care of everything and the state to take care of everything. So the, the Europeans are in trouble. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that the Europeans need is to uh, accept the culture codes. Mm -hmm. The idea to put in the same box the German and the Greek is absurd. Yeah. Is absurd. Is to try to give the same rules to giraffes and elephants. I mean, just no way, mm -hmm. you know. So who has this crazy idea? Well, some French politicians, by the way, yeah. <laughs> that's the French. <laughs> All right, so they, 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 they have to accept that these cultures are different. And before they become one big culture, it's going to take centuries. So you have to, mm -hmm. you have to respect the different, different cultures. So that's what the Europeans need, need to do to understand. The, the Brits understand that very well. Yeah. <laughs> the British, you know, they always felt that they are different. You know, this is an island, they're separated, they still have the pound, not the euro. And, uh, but to put the German, I mean, and, 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 and the Greek in the same, it, it's never going to work. It's just, you know, okay, that, that has to change. So they, they have to move to another structure now, which respects the cultural differences, you know. And, and for me, a good example is Switzerland. Switzerland is a great, great country. They're very successful. They're very, you know, but they have four official languages, yeah. you know, and, 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 and every subculture is respected, you see. So you can create something like that. Of course, it's possible. But the problem with America is more serious because the problem with America is that um, it's not a, an issue between Republican and Democrat. Mm -hmm. Uh, the big government that we have was created by Republicans. Yeah. You know, so it's not new. Mm -hmm. now, and Obama just made it bigger. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, both of them, the Republican, the problem is politicians in America. It's not Democrat or, or Republican. It's these the crazy politicians that, you know, in order to be reelected, they have to expand, 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 you know. So, so uh, that is a big issue. And, and uh, if it keeps going like that, we're going to become like France. You know, we have already one of the biggest deficits in, in, in the world and we're going to have more regulation and, you know, th there is... So, what to, should they do, you know, American and, 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 and European? What should they do? They should try to copy countries that are successful. And I call that best practice in governance. Yes. Best practice. Should we do that in, in manufacturing? Yes. Why don't we do that in governance? And what is the number one example for me? Singapore. Why? They have 2% unemployment. Spain, 25%. <laughs> so obviously Spain should learn something from, you know, I, I wrote an article and I say, Monsieur Hollande, the new French president, should go as an intern uh, in, <laughs> in Singapore to learn from these guys over there, you see. So what is, what is the, I think the Singaporean model is unique and very successful. Why? Because it has reptilian principle, reptilian principle, right? So what, what are these this basic pr principles, right? Uh, first of all, they have no, ga no gas, no oil, no land, no natural resources. They have nothing. They, they're not like, you know, spoiled little uh, Arab countries that uh, just live on, on royalties. No, no. So they had nothing. Yes. So what is the first thing they did? They said, okay, guys, 
we have no choice. We have to be better than the others because we have no resources, we're poor. In, 19, in 1965, when Malaysia re rejected Singapore, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the, the leader at the time, said, OK, no choice, we have to be the best. So what is the first thing we need to do? The first thing we need to do, clean. Clean. That's a reptilian priority. Mothers know that you have to be clean. The food has to be clean, the children. So you say, we, we not, we're not, we, we not, and it's very interesting because in Brazil you say, uh, we may be poor, but we clean. And we have an expression in Brazil. Huh? So that's what you say, clean. So we want the house to be clean, the street to be clean. So we want uh, the food to be clean. You need to be clean. Your clothes need to be clean. And clean, 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 clean. And that creates a mindset, a first imprint about discipline, demanding exigence, you know, it is your duty. The, the first thing that Lee Kuan Yew imprinted in people's mind is not right. It's not right. Yeah. It's duties. You know, and one of the problems in the American culture is that the criminals have more rights than the victims. <laughs> you see, so, so, okay, right, right, rights, you know, so, so no. So then the, the second one was um, you, you have to work hard. You know, that's that very interesting because it, it, it's, it's Chinese, but this is Confucius kind of a dimension. You know, uh, you have to work and you have to learn, 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 never stop learning, never stop learning. Um, and so that, and then there is this notion of respect. Mm -hmm. Respect your family, you respect your father. Of course, there is respect the authority and some leftist people around the world say so this is not good. Well, but anarchy <laughs> is not much better, you know. Yeah. I, I'd rather have a, 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 a respected authority that I can respect too because they're nice, they're great, they're doing a good job, you know. Right now, there is more, uh, 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 I think the average income in, in Singapore is something like $70,000 a year, average. Huh? They have more millionaires over there than anywhere in, else in the world. Um, with 5 million people, 5 million, they make 55 billion surplus between import and export, 55 billion. One quarter of what the Germans do with 80 million people, okay. only five. Can you imagine that? Uh, there is no corruption. You know why? Because all the civil servants make an average $1 million a year. So when you are director of an agency, you don't need more money, $1 million. It's amazing, you see. So, and because of that, because they pay very well the, the civil servants, uh, and they have the best people that want to become civil servants. Again, this is a, you know, a, a virtuous circle, if you want, right? Um, it's safe, it's very safe. You know, I've been there many times and, you know, women can walk at night in the street. There is absolutely, there is no graffiti because you go to jail, yes. <laughs> you know, and they, and they can. No uh, so people say, oh, this is bad, you know, they, they, they ban, they beat, wow, you know. I've done work in, in Singapore very much and when I ask young people in Singapore, um, you know, would they live somewhere else? And they say no. You know, they say, we, we, you know, I spent two years in uh, San Francisco, and I call that Sin Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd rather be in Singapore. This is a lot better here. You see, just, uh, so, you know, they, the young people, they love it. They just appreciate uh, the structure, the security, the safety, the, you know, transportation is almost free. You take the, the subway, it's very nice and beautiful and safe and, you know. I mean, so why don't we go and learn? And my next book is called The Global Code and The Global Mind. And I say that this is global leaders should look at the best practices around the world. You see, uh, uh, and, and even if I criticize the French all the time, the French medicine uh, is a lot better than American as an average. They, they get twice better result for one third of the price per person. Than, than in America. America is a waste, it's an incredible waste. I mean, if you're very rich, you get good medicine in, uh, but as an average, you know, so they should learn again from, you know, what are the French doing better in terms of medicine? Yeah. And Dr. Hapai, you know about my passion for Japan and uh, for me something very prov provocative is that the country has been facing trouble in overcoming the disturbing creativity and innovation blackout. Even, uh, uh, I mean, even in the Japanese movie industry, 
the Japanese movie industry lost space in recent years for the upcoming uh, Korean and Chinese films. And what for me is provocative is how could we help Japanese companies to readapt and to turn around in order to recover their relevant role in the global scenario? What happened with Japan? Yeah, you, you, you see, uh, that, that's why Japan, Japan needs Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, the Japanese code is almost is the opposite, you see. Uh, the, the Japanese, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've been studying uh, Japan uh, since 1964. The first time I went to Japan. And, and uh, you know, I had a company there for a while. I've done a, work, a lot of work in Japan. Uh, very interesting. Japanese culture is fascinating. It's one of the most interesting culture for me to, to study and decode. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they are the problem of the Japanese culture, yes. right? And what is the problem? I mean, the Korean that has been for three generations in Japan are still Korean. Yes. They will never be Japanese. All right? Mm -hmm. So there is no integration. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, the Japanese mind have a very, they try, they make, they make efforts to, but they don't integrate. Uh, they Japanize, they transform, yes. you see. So they, 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 not like the uh, feijoada, you mix things. No, 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 no. The, the Japanese mind is the purity of the blade, the high density of the laser. That's why they were so good in quality, in intense, you know. But is intensity in something that is pure Japanese, purely Japanese. You see, that's what they want. And so for a long time, they've been better than anybody else because of that. You see, absolutely, you see. But at a certain time, this high density uh, uh, is, is just so selfish and so self-centered that you forget the rest of the planet. You see, it, it doesn't... Uh, so, uh, Jap Japanese company have to face different challenges today. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the first one is that the, the Korean are uh, almost becoming more Japanese than the Japanese. Why? Because as you know, they have been occupied for more than 30 years by the Japanese. They were forced to think Japanese, to speak Japanese, to have Japanese name, Korean. Huh? Uh, and then when, uh, in 1945, they, the Japanese left, you know, um, the Korean went back to be Korean, but they had integrated yeah. all the good things, the quality and density and, you know, so, uh, 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 Korean as fantastic, they are like uh, Italian and Japanese at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, so they, they have the passion and the excitement of the Italian, but they have the intensity of the Japanese, you know. The Japanese are not Italian at all. <laughs> you see, there's this missing, I mean, they, they never integrate the Italian uh, dimension here, you see. They, they, so, uh, the, the Japanese company, uh, um, they, they, they're still in their mind imperialistic, yes. imperialistic. They want to impose Japan, you see. So they, they, they can't mix with, with, the, with the other cultures. And so so I, I see a better future for Brazil than for Japan, unfortunately. Then the big issue is population and aging population. Big, big issue, right? So you, you have this uh, uh, workforce in Japan that is shrinking, 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 um, an aging population. I mean, they, 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 they have a healthy lifestyle in Japan. So they live forever. <laughs> they never die. <laughs> but you have to feed them one way or another, you see. So uh, that's a big issue, uh, population in uh, versus, you know, China versus India versus... Uh, it's difficult for me what, you know, I've been studying in Japan for so long. Um, Japanese are not going to become uh, American, are not going to become uh, Chinese or Indian or Korean. They're going to be Japanese. They're all going to be Japanese. Very, and, and, and so the, they cannot pro make a progression, they cannot grow by rejecting their culture code. Yeah. They have to be on code with their own code mm -hmm. to be able to grow. But they can, because this is a very, very powerful and strong code. I mean, Another example, there is a lot of similarity between Japan and Germany. Mm -hmm. A lot of similarities. Between Japan and Germany? Oh, yeah. Same, same structure, oh, really? unconscious structure. Oh, uh, you know, the Japanese, when, when they needed to have a, a, a bureaucracy, they copied the German. Wow. 
<laughs> today, today they have in common the cars industry. You know, they were good soldiers. They were imperialistic soldiers. They were allies during the, the war. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities. Um, but the, ja the German managed to stay German and reinvent themselves. Yeah. So you see the, the, the Japanese again, because they have a lot of similarity with the German, they should look at the German and get a model over there on how the German are doing. You know, how come they, they're successful there? And because this is not off code with Japan. You see, there is the, the German and the Japanese have things in common. So the Japanese can copy some element of the German, which they did already in the past, like the bureaucracy and everything. So then they love the system, they love the systemic approach. They, you know, so, so that's where the Japanese can uh, grow. Two more questions. Uh, one thing that for me is very interesting is that always in the beginning of an archetype discovery process, you start off asking the client, your client, if I had all the answers, what would be your questions? I really would like to know if we had all the answers, what would be your questions? What are the intriguing questions or the things that are in your mind nowadays and that we, we would like to, to learn? You know, you know? I, I, if you had all the, uh, all the answers, I think my, my number one question will be, uh, where is the global leader that can be the pilot for this planet? You know, that, 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 uh, and that cannot be a politician. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a king, philosopher, uh, wizard, uh, high priest. So, I mean, something like that, you see, but that will be, there is a need for another archetype to come and, and, and to guide, you know, the, this, because right now we, we're going in so many different direction, uh, in part destroying the planet, which is bad and, you know, just like, so that, that, that would be my, uh, my dream to discover this uh, structure and, and, and beyond politics, beyond economy, beyond major corporation, you know, what would be the best uh, pilot? Uh, as Buckminster Fuller said, there is, you know, no, no pilot on this spaceship, uh, planet Earth. Well, that would be the need. The, the need is to have a, a pilot for this planet. Well, to close this unforgettable interview, if you would write a letter to our children about the key learnings and the recommendations on how to be a better individual or professional, what would be your key messages representing your core legacy? You know, I, 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 I believe that the, the uh, key message, because I, I have two boys and I know you have children too, so, you know, I, I think that what I learned from my mother, that, uh, you know, I, she was a very special woman. Um, she always told me one simple message that I would like to transmit to my children. Uh, she, you know, I, 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 I was kind of crazy when I was young. I'm still crazy today, but I was kind of crazy. I would try, you know, different crazy things. So, so one day I would play, you know, music and I say, I want to become a musician. One day I will paint and I would say, I want to become a painter. One day I would say, I want to cure children. I want to become a doctor. So, so. my mother always told me, whatever you're going to do, you're going to succeed. And for me, that was one of the best message anybody could tell me, especially my mother, because I say, well, maybe she's right, you know, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to succeed, you know, this is so, so I would like my children to have this self-confidence that, you know, don't try to do what I want you to do. Don't try to be what I want you to be. Don't try to be what anybody else wants you to be. But whatever you want to do, you're going to succeed. So, you know, so I, I, I think the, the wrong idea is say, oh, I want my, my, my son to be a doctor or an engineer. No, forget him. Whatever they want to do, they will, you know. So I think this is the best legacy that you can give to your children is um, whatever you're going to do, you're going to be successful. Just trust yourself and do the best you can. Great. Well, Dr. Hapail, your Akhetap discovery legacy is fascinating and very on code with the historical moment that we are experiencing with the globalization when the world must learn to recognize, respect and learn how to deal with differences. Your company has helped to educate, to educate large organizations around the world 
on how to understand and to value the differences and use them in favor, in their favor and not against them. For all of us from Luziu Strategy Consulting, we are deeply honored and very proud of being part of Archetype Discover's worldwide family and sharing its mission. And thank you very much again for your interview. And it was really unforgettable and a pleasure for me to be here. Again. My pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.